Good afternoon and, and a very warm welcome. My name is Renata Oitz. I'm the co-director of CEU's Democracy Institute in, in Budapest, and I also teach comparative constitutional law at the Department of Legal Studies in Vienna. The occasion of, of our little meeting today is the much anticipated visit of President Bolsonaro not, not only to Moscow, the much but possibly Budapest. I have two experts with me uh, who will offer informed insight on what happens when illiberal Democrats go global. One of my panelists is Emilio Peluso Niedermeyer, who is an associate professor of constitutional law at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. And his recent book on constitutional the Erosion in Brazil, published by Hart, is an absolute must read. Uh, the other guest of the show is Tiago de Souza Amparo, who teaches uh, constitutional law and, uh, and human rights at the Chantulio Vargas Foundation Law School uh, in, Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo. Uh, Tiago has long connections to Central European University because he studied with us before and Although we, we were hoping to also have with us Rosanna Pinheiro Machado, uh, unfortunately due to a last minute health emergency, she, she wasn't able to, to join us, but we decided to, to, to carry on. Now, in terms of, in terms of setting the scene, uh, President Bolsonaro's visit to Moscow is certainly uh, starting major international waves in foreign policy circles, US diplomats are not particularly happy ab about his plans to, to visit, uh, especially in, in the shadow of the crisis with, with Ukraine. Uh, but the stop to, to Budapest, the very likely stop to Budapest is at least as interesting for those who care about, inter uh, about networking by, by liberal Democrats. The timing of the visit is at least interesting. Hungary is going into elections in early April and Brazil is going into elections in, in, in early October. And President Bolsonaro is very keen on international alliances with, with prominent like-minded leaders. If you recall uh, on his inauguration day on the 1st of January in 2019, in addition to, to Prime Minister Orban being physically present, he also received Prime Minister Netanyahu to, uh, to reflect where his sympathies lay. Now, Brazil's pro-democracy stance on the continent appears to be a little shaky. In the fall, uh, the Brazilian government refused to, to sign a diplomatic letter uh, that was meant to condemn President Daniel Ortega's bid for the Nicaraguan presidency. At the same time, uh, since President Trump uh, left office, Brazil seems to be a leader on the global war on gender, taking up the mantle of, of anti-abortion activism, leading the coalition that also sound, signed the Geneva Consensus Declaration. We also see that uh, President Bolsonaro is very keen on his American conservative relations. Uh, in 2021, he was a very proud, proud host of the American Conservative Political Actions Meeting. Uh, and he used this, that is the CPAC meeting, in order to fire up his supporters to come out to the streets to protest against other constitutional institutions. Um, you may recall that Budapest is going to become home to the next CPAC at the end of, of March 2022. So it is, and I could go on and on, but it is against this background that I, I think it's time to understand what it is that's worth knowing about Bolsonarism ahead of a presidential visit. So, so let me just ask, actually, you, you both... What do you think is important to know about President, President Bolsonaro's coming to office? Because ultimately, already his rise to power is interesting to, 
to understanding Bolsonarism at, at work. So I, whoever wishes to, to go first, just grab the occasion. Okay, thank you for the invitation, Professor Renata. Thank you, Laszlo and Michael for being with us today. And thanks, uh, uh, Thiago, for, for being here today too. It's always a, uh, it is a pleasure actually. It's the first time that we are together in a, in a round table like that. Uh, but I will mention just uh, quickly some of the facts that we should bear in mind for the rise of Bolsonaro to power in Brazil. So uh, Brazil have been facing, uh, let's say, uh, both a political and an economic crisis for at least 2013, when we had protests in Brazil uh, against uh, the government. Actually, it was a problem related to uh, uh, tickets uh, for, for Sao Paulo uh, uh, buses. And, uh, and then that uh, went and became a huge uh, protest that was directed mainly by the traditional media against the government of uh, Dilma Rousseff. At the time, uh, Rousseff was not properly, um, let's say, able to, to, to give or to, to appropriate that crisis in a sense that she could maintain uh, the support, the political support that she had in 2013. At the same time, uh, we must bear in mind that two uh, political scandals were uh, taking place in Brazil. Uh, the Federal Supreme Court in 2000. Uh, 12 was ruling on a, on a huge uh, uh, scandal, corruption scandal involving uh, PT mainly. Uh, it, it was called the, the Mensalão. Uh, it, it involved uh, the fact that uh, there were bribery that was paid for representatives in the National Congress to approve bills that were important for the government. And the Federal Supreme Court was uh, uh, very harsh in, in, in its rulings. Uh, the TV, uh, the media outlets all covered the, the, the ruling, the, the judgments, the trials. And so people uh, really started to develop a kind of anti-PT or anti-workers uh, party sentiment in Brazil. And then we had uh, the start in 2014 of uh, what we call the Operation Car Wash, the, the Operação Lava Jato, which involved one of the main or one of the, the people that try to be one of the main political actors now in Brazil, which is uh, Sergio Moro. He was the judge at that time. Uh, he was the judge responsible for uh, ruling against uh, former President Lula, imprisoning him. Uh, he was the judge that also um, leaked to the press conversations between Dilma, former President Dilma and President Lula that were truly important for creating the scenario for the impeachment process of President Dilma uh, in 2016, uh, an impeachment process that has several uh, failures, uh, in, in my view, actually, uh, I, I think that it was not properly an impeachment process, but more something like a parliamentary coup. And uh, with all those facts uh, in mind, we can see that uh, people uh, in Brazil generally from different classes could develop a kind of not only anti-sentiment uh, a sentiment anti-PT, but also a sentiment against the political class as a whole. And then uh, at the same time, you have uh, the development of a, a rightist movement, movement in Brazil, actually more like a far right uh, movement that was taking place at least, let's say the 2000s. Uh, the armored forces paid attention in the formation of these rightist uh, movements. And they thought that uh, supporting Bolsonaro, a former military, and uh, having this kind of background with this rightist movement was important for that time and for creating the, the discourse that uh, Bolsonaro was actually an outsider and uh, it was important to elect him, to clean everything. And uh, even though he was a, a representative in the National Congress for more than 30 years, uh, the idea that he was an outsider was something that really gripped on people's minds and people really supported him for uh, his election. I think we can deb debate other arguments in, in the following, but let's hear Chago on it. Um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Woods, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Emilio, for joining. Uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure. To, uh, after reading so much uh, that you wrote, it's a pleasure that uh, we are here in the same panel. 
Um, so I agree with what you said about the, um, the main features about uh, how Bolsonaro uh, came to power. I would add um, another element or highlight some of the elements that you already mentioned. Um, I think that you're completely right about the sentiment against political class as a whole and the way the ways in which the Bolsonaro um, managed to uh, portray himself as an outsider, despite the fact that he was in the Congress for uh, decades. Um, I think another element that you uh, mentioned there is that, um, and that I would like to highlight, is the fact that there was a cult of, um, of a kind of a cult of a personality of a cult of this uh, image of the strong man um, in two ways um, because during this uh, the several corruption scandals and the, the corruption lawsuits we have the development of the figure of uh, Sergio Moro uh, who is right now um, who, who was a judge in the, the main case against former president Lula um, whose rulings was uh, later on uh, much more recently um, overturned by the Supreme Court, and he uh, is now running for president. So sometimes Brazilian politics looks like uh, um, a soap opera in the way that you have these uh, main uh, figures out there. Uh, right now, the, the current landscape for those who are not following so closely uh, the elections in Brazil, we have elections this year in October, and the main candidates are basically um, former President Lula, who was in jail, um, for, um, the judge who sent him to jail, and uh, Sergio Moro, and uh, Bolsonaro, who is the guy who was elected after he was in jail. So um, this was very, and I think that one key important aspect of the Brazilian politics in that time, uh, in 2018, was a dismantling, a dismantling of the um, uh, ideal political parties and and this cult of personality in, in the in the figure of Sergio Moro and later on uh, of Bolsonaro. And, I'm, and I say this because uh, the main play election playbook is that who gets more time on TV, on radio, uh, gets the election, or who has this, uh, the large support of the political parties gets the election. Um, Bolsonaro inverted it and, and completely changed this playbook. Um, and I think another element that we had to to add here, the way uh, in, uh, the ways in which he gets to the power is basically internet as well, and and the connections with WhatsApp and and the communication channels. That he, he did not go to a political debate um, during the campaign, um, partly because also he was uh, he suffered an attack, a physical attack, uh, but also later on because he didn't want uh, he didn't um, before that enough that he he didn't want to join the political debates. Um, he had a very tight uh, tiny time, uh, short time in the election, in the election uh, program on TV, on radio. Uh, so I think that also um, uh, the communication uh, uh, channels, especially with the far right and the, and the right communication channels, uh, not not so much through the mainstream media and through the main uh, mainstream uh channels uh, it's also another aspect that we have to uh bear in mind and one evidence of that is that the center right for the center political parties also some of them were dismantled so for instance the the social democrats who were in brazil are sometimes center center right um uh who ruled the government who ruled the, the country before lula um, they reduced drastically the number of seats that they have in the Congress, uh, which shows that the people are not putting their faith, their, uh, faith on uh, the traditional politicians. So I think that when you put all those things together, uh, the cult of personality, uh, uh, the communication, scandals, uh, communication channels, uh, and, and uh, dismantling of this traditional playbook, and I would add one thing that probably Hosanna would say if she were here, um, if she was here, is, is uh, the fact that Bolsonaro really rapidly uh, became famous, especially after one uh, scandal when he was uh, telling another Congress, uh, another Congresswoman, that he would never um, uh, commit a sexual violence uh, against her because she's too ugly, and this and this uh, really showed. Um, the personality of Bolsonaro uh, in terms of uh, being a, a 
perhaps openly misogynist, uh, being openly appealing to violence. His uh, symbol during the election was making a, a sign of a gun with his hands. So uh, being scandalous was a way, his way to, to bypass this uh, election playbook. Um, according to which he would not need the, um, uh, the the support of the political the main political parties because well he um, he's scandalous so he gets the attention uh, so I think that in in this way being um, and later on we see that he he thinks of himself uh, or he wanted to think of himself as autocrats such as Orban and others and I think this this is kind of the um, DNA of it uh, which is this kind of being scandalous to get attention and we see this throughout his uh, time in. In, um, in power. So, so let me just put, uh, put, bring out attention here, because on the one hand, you emphasize big personalities, scandals. Some scandals are personal, others are actually legal. The corruption scandals are, are highly illegal and, and, and criminal. One presidential impeachment comes uh, into, into the picture. Uh, and and there, a very direct connection with the voters, with, with, with constant Twitter messaging on the one hand. On the other hand, this anti-establishment and anti-elite politics still takes advantage of institutional structures, procedures, and, and infrastructure. So they use constitutional procedures and they use the judiciary and prosecution in order to, to rise. And so there seems to be a tension, at least for, for an outsider, uh, or at least for an outsider coming from a country where one of the first moves of, of a government that, that got two-thirds majority in 2010 was to invent its very own constitutional infrastructure. So can you, can you explain a little bit how the, the constitutional framework supports anti-establishmentarian personality-driven antagonistic politics of, of the kind that you describe. And of course, we'll come back to the, to, these, to the features of this politics being extremely divisive, running on, on friend-enemy distinctions. So how do you put this together that it's not trying to dismantle the infrastructure of government, but rather taking advantage of it uh, in, in, in ways you, you just discussed? Uh, um, let, let me start, please. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, uh, specifically uh, Bolsonaro and his supporters uh, take, took advantage of this, the constitutional structure to, to reach their, their objectives. I think that uh, this is more kind of uh, uh, accidental situation in, in the sense that, uh, first of all, uh, I must agree with uh, uh, Chag in the sense that uh, uh, actually, we have this idea of a strong man uh, uh, playing politics in Brazil, and this is not something new. This is something that uh, uh, takes part of our, our political history uh, for a certain time. But more than that, uh, maybe we go uh, in tandem with other Latin American countries where you have uh, uh, a strong executive. So you have uh, a strong uh, president, and that strong president uh, actually uh, captures the whole uh, political force that uh, are in dispute in, in, in the country. So uh, these are the kind of elections that people pay more attention, that people go to vote for, that people get into disputes uh, much more. And I think that uh, those disputes were uh, seen uh, in the 2018 elections as something uh, that was a decision, let's say, of life or death, in the sense that uh, you have a very polarized, polarized country, uh, and I think that the internet played a, a pivotal uh, role on that, and social media played a pivotal uh, role on that. Uh, and in that scenario, uh, someone that uh, seemed to be very uh, honest, even if he said some things that people disagree with, uh, would be the more, let's say, authentic, uh, arguably the more authentic candidate to be elected. And then I think that uh, if the, the, the 1988 constitution gives a space for this kind of thing, uh, is only in the sense that uh, it maintains and uh, uh, it have maintained it actually, uh, if we compare to the 1946 constitution, 
a system of uh, what we call here in Brazil coalitional presidentialism by, by which you have a very strong president, but he also has to uh, have uh, a kind of dialogue, a uh, kind of connection with uh, several parts of the political scenario. This is something that interestingly shows uh, some of the failures of uh, Bolsonaro's government, but also at the same time represents something that could, in a certain sense, create the, the venue for him to be uh, elected. But I don't think that they explored it uh, voluntarily. This is something that uh, they, they thought that uh, uh, big leaders, strong men were being elected in all over the world. And then the connections of this far right with uh, foreign uh, 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 foreign forms of uh, far right uh, in the political scenario. In the US, I, I don't think that, uh, I think that uh, in Hungary, this is something that uh, increased after Bolsonaro raised it to power. But in the US, the, the form by which, or, or the way by which Steve Bannon made connections with uh, Eduardo Bolsonaro, uh, who is the son uh, of, uh, of President Jair Bolsonaro, and uh, he was the, 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 the federal deputy, the representative that uh, received the, 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 the biggest number of votes in, in our uh, elections his, history, actually. Uh, so I, I think that he paid attention on that, but not, not in the sense that uh, this is something that constitutionally we should explore. And this is something that uh, is one of the features of Bolsonarism. I, I don't think that uh, part of Bolsonarism explores what illiberalism has uh, of weapons, of using uh, juridical devices uh, to reach some political target, but uh, they also uh, prefer to violate directly the law or the constitution. I think that uh, unlike Hungary, um, I, just quickly, I think that unlike Hungary, that maybe uh, if I understood correctly, um, Orban had to um, create some idea of uh, nation building and re re and reframing the constitutional terms and establishing the constitution uh, with the majority he already has. Um, and then he did that. Uh, and it was not clear during the election that he was supposed he was doing that. Uh, Bolsonaro, I think that what he did was uh, actually um, in practical terms, uh, he he developed a lot of policies that are actually not through constitutional uh, channels, but actually through administrative acts and, and other ways uh, to dismantle uh, constitution, but not change the constitution. So the constitution is that it, it stays there as a skeleton, but not, uh, and the Supreme Court is running uh, to try to maintain the skeleton there. But um, when you look at areas like gun regulation or environmental regulation, um, or uh, the regulation of the tox, uh, toxics in the agriculture, um, Bolsonaro is very uh, efficient in dismantling uh, the, those policies without changing the constitution itself. Um, and, and, and he's very efficient in, in doing so. Um, and secondly, I think that another feature that is maybe different than in Hungary, although in Hungary you do also have, of course, uh, corruption scandals and everything. But I think one thing that is really interesting is that um, Bolsonaro, despite the fact that we have a, a constitutional arrangement in which the president has a lot of power, uh, that the executive power has uh, controls the budget and, and managed to govern even with a multi party uh, system, uh, and there are a lot of uh, political scientists uh, establishing uh, that thesis, um, Bolsonaro decided it, since the beginning to rule the country uh, and to engage with the, uh, with the Congress, not through uh, the political parties themselves, but say that he wants to rule the country with um, uh, kind of the coal informal coalitions that we have, um, semi-formal coalitions that we have in the Congress, such as the coalition uh, for the Bible of Christians, the coalition uh, for guns uh, and, and gun dysregulation, uh, and the coalition uh, for uh, the uh, agro-business and the agriculture. Uh, so he tried to do that, he failed. And basically the main political parties, parties um, that we call Centro, which is like the middle, uh, the, the middle, ideological middle, but uh, usually they are right uh, inclined. Uh, they basically basically control uh, the the budget. Then they control uh, in a way uh, they control Bolsonaro, not the way around. So I think that 
uh, the arrangement that we have now is that it's not a president with a, a parliamentary majority, certainly as in, in, in Hungary. And much of what he's saying about nation building and, 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 and having these grand uh, speeches uh, does not translate necessarily into policy. Uh, unless he managed to do so through administrative acts such as in the environmental and in the government regulation. So I think it's a different, um, uh, he tries to play by the rules, um, but the rules kind of like uh, destroyed his, his ambition to kind of a new project of dismantling everything. So let me, let me just push you a little bit on, on, on the particular point of very support for this regime. And, and what stabilizes it in, in the long run. And, and the reason why I'm asking this is because you, you said, so what we see as very inflammatory language, very, very often insults and threats, threats of violence through, through tweets. Emilio actually said that it, it's read in a certain context or in certain co corners as a sign of authenticity. As a, as a sign of honesty, as opposed to a, a violent threat. And this is a, this is a very interesting take on, on, uh, on, on the style of communication, but also it comes at, at consequences. So can we unpack a little bit, both the forces of stabilization and also the corners of support for, for a president who, who seems to, to be ready to physically attack different corners of the population on extremely short notice. I, 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 maybe Tiago will want to go first and then Emilio, but I just... Yeah, no. Um, so I think that uh, to understand the Bolsonaro and Bolsonarism as the political uh, alliance and, 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 and his support, I think that um, it's kind of a, a monster of Frankenstein with the different aspects and glued a very, in a very fragile way, I would say, uh, but it also apparently in an efficient way. Uh, so uh, fragile in the sense that it's not coherent or, 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 or not, he doesn't strive for coherence. So I think that one aspect is that uh, he, uh, when he um, was, the, he appeared to be the main candidate for um, against uh, Labour Party, um, he immediately got the support uh, of the elite groups and the richest people in the country. And the polls uh, before the election show that if it was dependent on the richest people in the country, he would have won uh, the election in the first round, uh, on the first round. Uh, so, and he managed to uh, kind of embrace the support uh, through uh, signs saying that, well, actually we are going to develop in, um, kind of a new liberal um, economic policies. Uh, he, appoint, he, he appointed an uh, economic czar uh, that managed, that he actually is failing. He's not managed to do what he wanted to do at the beginning, but he, he appointed a, a someone who said, well, we are going to um, strive for more uh, neoliberal policies in terms of um, uh, in, in economic terms. Also, Bolsonaro himself was very much in favor of more protectionist uh, policies when he was a congressman. Um, another a feature of this uh, of this uh, monster um, is uh, his clear appeal to violence, as I mentioned in the beginning. And we had to to think about that Brazil is a very violent country um, in different ways. We uh, one figure is that uh, police kills six thousand people uh, per year. Um, which means that it's uh, six times more than the United States, entire United States per year, um, even not considering the, the population differences. Uh, so he appeals to violence, which has some appeal to uh, in, in, uh, in, in the overall population. Another aspect of this monster is conservative in terms of uh, being conservative in terms of um, gender, sexuality, and things, uh, 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 things of that sort, and with increased um, participation of uh, evangelicals uh, among the uh, electoral bases, 
uh, he managed to appeal to those uh, to those groups. We did, uh, some experts are saying that um, selling a return to certainty in a way, uh, in, and I like this phrase. In, uh, they mean that by by that they mean uh, well, the world is very complicated. You know, we have all these LGBT people trying to, for us to saying that we have uh, several genders. We we people are trying to teach the things to children. You know, all uh, saying things like this, which uh, are largely uh, true. But they, he sells the idea that, well, we need to return uh, to uh, a sense of certainty in terms of gender, sexuality, and so on. And so I think uh, selling this is important. Um, and finally, I think that one, uh, one aspect is this anti-system. Uh, so being anti what he calls globalism, anti what he calls communism, which is er amazingly everything. Um, so anti uh, a lot of things. So, um, so it, this gathers people in the way that they are just, they are not satisfied with the status quo uh, for uh, because of the economic uh, deprivation. Um, uh, Emilio mentioned that in the big, uh, he started his narrative. Emilio started his narrative in two thousand thirteen, where all the country uh, faced several demonstrations, and partly because of this of the of the economically uh, economic deprivation and and several other aspects. So I would say that uh, his support uh, comes from all those angles uh, together. And uh, uh, Hosanna, uh, who also has a very interesting um, uh, research, anthropological research interview, especially poor supporters of Bolsonaro. And one of, the, he, one of her findings is that um, they appeal to uh, being uh, not necessarily a worker, but being uh, having your own business, uh, having individualistic, uh, ideas of uh, economic development. So not striving for better social policies, but striving for, well, I want to earn more. I want to be interpret. Uh, I want to uh, have my own business. I want to work. Uh, even if you work in a gig economy, you have this policy uh, in this in this in this view. And I think that Bolsonaro managed also to appeal to this by saying that well, all those people are trying to uh, get your money through corruption. All those people are trying to uh, get uh, get your money, and so we need to um, appeal to this kind of like uh, more neoliberal uh, perspective. So I think when you put all these things together, you have a very strong uh, political basis uh, to uh, win uh, election. Emilio? Yeah, I, I, just to, to, to put a few words and uh, try to, to complete some of the things that uh, uh, Chag was mentioning. I think that uh, uh, if we have one uh, main idea or a backbone that defines uh, what uh, who are the, the supporters of Bolsonaro, I think that uh, it is the a kind of an idea that appeared in, in the chapter that uh, me, uh, Bustamante, and Maffei wrote uh, for, for the book uh, uh, edited by, by Renata on, on liberalism, and uh, uh, it, that uh, it is the idea of a, a model citizen, or, or what we call here in Brazil, cidadão de bem, uh, which is a very a kind of a kaleidoscope, like uh, Ster Solano describes it, a, a researcher from, from Brazil. And uh, if we pay attention to, to the research that is made by all those uh, uh, researchers that are trying to understand what is the far right here in Brazil now, Esther Solano, Rosana Piero Machado, or Isabella Calil, uh, what we see is that uh, uh, they are showing that uh, there is a very heterogeneous basis for Bolsonaro. But uh, what we can depict as something that they share is this uh, idea of a, of a species of conservatives but uh, which is not just a simple conservative, it's, it's much more than that. Uh, I, I always remember the research that is made by uh, Karen uh, Stanner in the sense that uh, authoritarians would be a type of uh, conservatives. And I think that uh, it fits uh, very well what happens here in Brazil because we don't have properly a liberal society if we go to the the social research that uh, have been evaluating what people think here in Brazil in the past, let's say, five or, or, or four years. Uh, polls from 2017, for instance, they show that uh, people generally, for more than 70, 80 percent, they uh, actually uh, hated the, the, the Workers' Party. They uh, would opt for something different from democracy. So the support for someone who would present a different solution for all those problems and that would not be the workers party uh, would be a good solution uh, 
Chago was mentioned that in 2013, one of the grievances people were showing were against the, the economic situation. But if we compare the economic situation from 2013 to today, especially before, after the COVID-19 pandemic, they are in a very worse situation. Uh, and they don't get angry with Bolsonaro. The, the, the supporters that form, let's say, 15, 20% of the population now in Brazil, they will be uh, uh, people with fidelity with Bolsonaro until the election and even in, in the election uh, because of this conservative uh, way of, uh, of seeing things. That, that is one of the reasons we can see that uh, in, in order to stabilize his government, he needed to rely in, uh, in those elites that uh, are not properly democratic. Uh, the first of them, uh, the armed forces, the military, and the military, they have these connections with Bolsonaro. I think that uh, they uh, went to a point where they didn't have any good candidate, but Bolsonaro seemed to be the best one because he was a former military, uh, even being a bad military in the, in the words of a former dictator in Brazil. Uh, and uh, with the, the, the Kurds, the judges in Brazil, uh, I think uh, we cannot say that the, 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 the judicial branch as a whole is undemocratic Brazil. That would be to go too far. But I think that we have several uh, uh, people that form, that take off scene as prosecutors or as judges that have a kind of worldview that is more like uh, what Bolsonaro defends than what, uh, let's say, the, the Constitution of 1988 uh, uh, shows or represents. Uh, and then if you have this kind of support, you can define your project as something that uh, it is not only constitutional, but legal and stabilize your, your government throughout those uh, four years. Uh, and, and then I think that, uh, I think maybe this is, would be something or part of the next question. Uh, the problem is if you have a, a pandemic and if you have an enduring economic crisis that uh, is not solved, by any uh, uh, economic czar like uh, uh, Chago described it. What about one or the other of you answering the question Emilio so kindly posed? So uh, what, what, happens, what happens in a pandemic ridden country with an enduring economic crisis? And of course, President Bolsonaro is known for his anti-vaxxer uh, views and also building an international alliance on 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 that platform. Yeah, but uh, that's very interesting, and I want to highlight that um, first. What uh, Emilio said about the the current situation is is much worse than it was when the uh, manifestation the, the demonstrations uh, in two thousand thirteen erupt. It's um, much worse in terms of economic, in terms of health. Um, and it's a question of how the the country can um, how the country can deal and and and, and understand the situation of the uh, of the pandemic of six thousand uh, six hundred thousand people being killed uh, during the pandemic. Um, I think maybe there are ways uh, we can uh, look at it. One is that um, Bolsonaro has a core basis of supporters that is uh, declining, but it's keeping uh, at a minimum. And so probably he reached uh, both his um, ground and his uh, top ceiling in the sense that he cannot uh, probably he is not going to be much more than what he is at now uh, around twenty percent. Um, especially because the people uh, you see the the the, um, the support even even uh, among. For instance, evangelicals, or even among, um, uh, and especially among the poor people, not supporting uh, Bolsonaro anymore, or declining the support of Bolsonaro, um, and partly because of the, um, uh, partly because of the of his uh, of his policies. I think what um, what happened during the pandemic is that. Um, Despite the the country showed that, it, despite the fact that he's open, he's openly uh, anti-vax. Uh, the country uh, showed clearly that people, even those who support Bolsonaro, uh, largely go to uh, get vaccinated. So the fact of um, anti-vax movement uh, that we see in some parts of the United States, for instance, um, or the big demonstrations we see in countries like in France and other, other countries, we do not see um, in Brazil. 
Um, and for probably for the reason that we are used to get vaccinated and we have one of the largest or if not the largest um, public uh, health uh, system available uh, for free in, in the country, in the world. So I think that um, what he, uh, what, what the effect of his anti-policy, anti-vax policies it did not uh, get, a, it did not uh, produce effect on re, on people's decision to get vaccinated. But I think what the pandemic managed to do is manage to get Bolsonaro um, a way to survive through the pandemic, ironically, because people could not go on the streets. Uh, some people went and, and later on the pandemic, when the numbers of that uh, decreased for a while, people went on the streets uh, to demonstrate. But I think that uh, big because it was during the pandemic and people were afraid and people were uh, hungry um, and, and the, the economic situation, the health situation was um, immensely uh, bad. Uh, I think people did not have, uh, did not manage to have the resources to go out in the streets and to, um, and, and to be out there uh, fighting against uh, the government. So, which ironically made him uh, look like he, in spite of the fact he was uh, managing very poorly the pandemic, he, uh, he managed to get a political survival um, out of it. Um, and then by the end of it, um, by, by the end of his term right now, um, impeachment, is, uh, talking about impeachment is kind of an illusion, even uh, in the opposition. Because the position that makes the the, the, the thinks about this uh, the falling equation, and that if we get rid of him, maybe someone uh, someone else is stronger than him will, will appear, and it's better to beat him on the election ballot than actually getting um, him out uh, through uh, impeachment. So I think that ironically, uh, the pandemic helped him to survive uh, until the end of his term. Um, because impeachment is very unlikely now, and um, and and people could not go out on the streets and demonstrate, um, and also he managed to get um, a basic income uh, scheme uh, to uh, help people, uh, but not from his will, because it was the parliament who proposed, and basically he was against his will that he managed to get um, that people managed to get some uh, uh, money from the government to to go through uh, the pandemic. So essentially, to, to summarize Tiago's last comment is that uh, some of the measures which were passed against Bolsonaro's bill by Congress in order to offer some, some economic stability to, to the lowest income voters serve Bolsonaro ironically, and not those who not those who support these these measures. I will ask you two questions uh, in one in, in, in which which you expect, but just to just to let uh, the viewers know what's coming. I will ask you, first of all, about sources of resistance. And and where do you see any form of of hope of of returning to normalcy from from Bolsonarism, if there is normalcy after Bolsonarism. And the last question I will ask is, is what is the benefit for, for him in now going to Moscow and stopping, possibly very likely stopping in, in, in Budapest? So who is the audience of these visits and what, what, what's meant to be achieved by those? But first, let's talk about Let's talk about the sources of resistance. At the moment in the polls, former President Lula is seemingly uh, uh, very doing very strongly. He also has the, the credentials of a battle-hardened and, and unjustly prisoned, imprisoned uh, political actor. So, so those are extra good credentials in, in a race like this. Um, so where do you see where do you see sources of resistance to Bolsonaro and, and what could bring normalcy back? To, to to Brazil, Emilio, maybe or yeah. Yeah, I, I think that uh, first of all, institutionally, uh, if we have some support for Bolsonaro uh, inside the judiciary branch as a whole, uh, I would say that the Federal Supreme Court uh, made, uh, let's say, at, at least an interesting uh, uh, form or, or case law, actually a case law after Bolsonaro reached power. So from 2019 on and comparing to the previous years, I think that the, the Federal Supreme Court, of course, could have done much more, but uh, I guess that some rulings were important to show that uh, uh, one of his most conservative or some of his most conservative 
uh, uh, planes were not be approved by the, the Federal Supreme Court. So uh, it ruled on uh, 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 applying uh, the law against racism to uh, homophobic uh, acts. Uh, uh, the court decided in, a, in several cases in which uh, COVID-19 uh, needed public policies that Bolsonaro was uh, just confronting and, and, and leaving uh, open uh, without any kind of decision. So um, think about the uh, vaccination. The federal Supreme Court decided that the vaccination, it's uh, mandatory, although no one can be forced to take a vaccine. It is mandatory. So uh, uh, states and, and uh, 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 cities can create other obligations for people who, do, who don't want to, to get vaccinated. So I think that the federal Supreme Court showed some kind of resistance. The National Congress, at least in the first half of Bolsonaro's term, had some interesting responses, but afterwards, uh, it, the speaker is now uh, a supporter of Bolsonaro, so it's not, uh, I wouldn't say that it is properly a source of resistance. I think that civil society uh, showed some kind of uh, uh, organization. Uh, we were thinking about and talking about academic freedom. So I think that universities uh, show it that they, they uh, have an importance in defining what are the main poli uh, public policies against COVID-19. Uh, and uh, even though Bolsonaro tried to attack those, those universities because of his anti-intellectual uh, approach, uh, I think that he failed uh, on it. And I think that uh, even if the political opposition was not able to create uh, hurdles in, in, uh, in a good sense uh, during the, the uh, Bolsonaro's term, I think that uh, at least Lula is trying to organize uh, a kind of uh, uh, coalition that can uh, be uh, can beat him in the elections. So I think that uh, uh, what, uh, I don't know if Lula is thinking about other countries in the world or his advisors, but I think that uh, that uh, traditional recipe of the, the, the opposition try to uh, unite people that were different in the past. So Lula uh, uh, is thinking about having a, a vice, as vice president, uh, a former uh, uh, adversary, an opponent uh, politically. So I think that uh, this is some of the tactics that can help uh, us surviving uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, but I think that finally, that uh, even though if we survive Bolsonaro, Bolsonaroism will uh, stick for a long time. And this is something really uh, important for us to pay attention. Uh, the radicalism that is the basis of this movement is something that can hurt people, that can create uh, situations that uh, we will face violations of, uh, of uh, human rights. Uh, Chago knows about it. Uh, we have people uh, in the internet defending uh, the creation of a Nazi party in Brazil in the past two or three days. So uh, the scenario won't be an easy, an easy one for the years to come. Tiago, apart from the normalization of radicalization and lack of civility and violence and living with deep controversies as, center, as the core of an ideology. So I think that um, there are certain things that um, that will last, and and I think Bolsonaro will last as a doctrine or as a, a political ideology of um, uh, of radicalism. But I think that uh, the consequences of the Bolsonaro's um, presidency will also last for a while. So first, um, my experience with the with Hungary, for instance, is the um, uh, dismantling of the um, universities and uh, and especially the resources uh, that universities have. Um, so, for instance, the last uh, national uh, exam that people uh, go through to um, to to get, to get a university seat, they, um, uh, they it was like basically the poor people and uh, black people were uh, drastically reduced their participation in this exam, especially because of the economic situations and 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 the dismantling of research, scientific research in Brazil is also uh, very clear and will last for a while uh, to to remedy this. 
Um, another aspect that I would highlight is the fact that um, Bolsonaro appointed also two uh, justices uh, to the Supreme Court, and uh, those justices are young, and they will stay there for a long time. And uh, we can think about uh, we think we can think about uh, the fact that well, it's only two uh, justices, but the, but in Brazil. The Supreme Court uh, justices also have a lot of power individually, uh, so it can also create some damage uh, in the near future. So two days ago, the, the latest um, uh, appoint, uh, the latest justice uh, uh, in the Supreme Court, he said that, well, I'm, um, I want to be like a politician, uh, being close to the people and on the street, like the politician are are close to the people on the street. So he was saying that in the way that of being a popular uh, minister, whatever that means. Um, so he would uh, be continue to be there. And I think that's important to remember. Another thing that is important to remember is that uh, the dismantling of the legal accountability of the president um, as, a, as a culture in, 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 in Brazil, uh, because the, the, the general attorney's office uh, basically did not uh, file charges against the president. Uh, he opened a lot of preliminary investigations against the press, uh, against the government, but in a way to say that he was doing something, but actually he was not. Uh, what he did was to fire up uh, uh, press charts or try to, uh, to press charts against um, uh, university professors that criticized him. So I think that uh, the legal, uh, the lack of legal accountability also is one thing that uh, might continue because, or the use of the legal institutions in a partisan way is something that might last uh, for a while. And of course, the, um, uh, the radicalization. So I think that the, op the doors of the hell are open. Uh, so the way that he, um, Emilio was saying is that for the past uh, two, three years, uh, myself and other people are, are fighting against people who openly uh, said on a podcast of one of the most famous podcasts in Brazil, he openly said that we should establish and that we should allow, the law should allow a new uh, a Nazi party to be established. Um, so one thing that we're discussing now is whether uh, we should tolerate Nazis or not. So that's the level of political debate in Brazil right now. Um, and, uh, and and one thing that it was it, that came out of it is that in some people can say, well, this only uh, talk on the public debate and it doesn't uh, uh, resonate on, on people's life. But the fact is that uh, a research last week showed that in the last uh, three years, uh, there was a rise of 270% uh, uh, of um, neo-Nazi groups um, in Brazil. So this is a way to show that, well, evidence uh, shows that radicalism and far right Right, it's not. It's far from uh, from uh, ending, um, and I think the day uh, even the Bolsonaro is out, uh, the next day uh, those um, uh, those uh, this legacy of dismantling universities, uh, partisanship in the um, uh, in the legal institutions, and the radicalism on the streets uh, are, con are going to continue, um, and we had to be be very mindful uh, of this. So let me let me come to the to the question which I promised I will ask, which is why visit, why come now to, to Moscow and potentially to, to Hungary? I mean, we are certainly having very interesting bilateral relations with Brazil because you are building airplanes for us, uh, military military planes, and, and there is talk or there has been talk of, of closer and closer higher education exchanges trying to also in, uh, increase the volume of, of cooperation between universities and exchange students. Um, so, so those are potential agenda items, of course, but, but what's in it in the long run uh, for, for Bolsonaro for, for visiting Moscow and potentially stopping by in, in Budapest as you see it? Emilio. <laughs> yeah, no, just quickly, uh, I think that that uh, Thiago is, is uh, knows much more ab about international relations uh, than me. But I think that uh, this is part of this uh, uh, attempt to uh, create a kind of a, a type of movement uh, or to endure with this kind of uh, far right movement, even though he can be or cannot be actually in the in power in the in the next few years. I don't think that the, I, I think that this is. Uh, more important actually for Bolsonaro than for Bolsonaro. Uh, 
Brazil is traditionally known in international relations for preserving peace and to be outside uh, those kind of conflicts. Uh, so uh, the visit is something that is not appropriate for, for, for these times. This is something that he could have uh, postponed uh, if he was following the, the traditional way of our foreign uh, ministry uh, works work. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, this, is, this is something important for try to find more support for uh, Bolsonarism to see what uh, would be important if Bolsonaro leaves power, which I think, uh, I hope that it, it can happen in October, but uh, we never know what can uh, take place until, until there. But I don't think that, that this is something important for the country as a whole. And if we stop to think uh, the foreign uh, uh, ministry uh, in Brazil had, has lost his uh, 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 way of thinking uh, pragmatically uh, or even in a good position for Brazil in international relations. So I think this is much more uh, due to Bolsonaro's position than to the uh, reflected position from the foreign uh, ministry here in Brazil. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what Emilio said, and I think that um, we had to to uh, to bear in mind that uh, Bolsonaro initiated a new phase or new stage, a uh, new kind of foreign policy um, in Brazilian uh, recent history, which is a very personal and uh, ideological one. Uh, because um, in terms of um, the relevance of different players, uh, um, Brazil always or uh, trying to respect to engage with international organizations um, and uh, with in the previous government uh, in different ways, but uh, they always manage to 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 place an important role, uh, play an important role in those institutions, um, international institutions such as UN or. Uh, or, 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 or the American organization uh, of the organization of American states. Um, but what Bolsonaro did is that uh, during the election, he even uh, thought of uh, in one interview said, well, we had to consider whether we want to continue in the United Nations, which was completely nonsense. Um, but it shows that he has this policy of uh, not engaging so proactively with the international institutions. And the way he does a foreign policy is to uh, build alliance based on ideological and personal connections with the with the presidents. Of course, all the presidents have some preferences and 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 and, and close relations. Uh, but what he uh, he's doing is basically uh, showing that well, I still have some international prestige. So I'm going to Russia in the middle of a crisis, and and I can you know want to show the United States that I'm not uh, a sub. A subject of subordinated to his uh, wishes of me going or not going to uh, Russia. Uh, so I think in one way, there's a theological alliance that he, the only way, the only countries that he can go for and they will receive him uh, are Russia, Poland, Hungary, and, and countries that they allied uh, to him, with him. Uh, secondly, he wants to show that, well, I'm not subordinated to a United States um, uh, uh, wishes. Um, and uh, and he does that, uh, putting uh, uh, a kind of a um, look, a shadow of uh, economic interest. So he he's saying as as an excuse that he's going there to build this bilateral agreement with Russia, uh, although he's not going to sign anything. Uh, he he's he's saying that he's uh, has some economic connections with those countries, although the economic connections are much lower than what we have with the United States or China. Um, but I think that we are seeing kind of a leftover of such a ideological, ideological foreign policy because before um, the current minister we had another minister who was very much ideological uh, he was uh, very clearly talking about um, against the nations, talking about against uh, China. Also, China is one of the, is one of the, is the main uh, economic player. Um, he was much in favor of the Trump, and when he Trump left, uh, we were one of the few, one of the last countries to uh, congratulate or recognize Biden as the president. Um, so I think that uh, he, he, we are seeing the leftover of such a policy. Also, the minister. Uh, um, that the head of the minister is not uh, so ideological uh, anymore as it was before. So I think that uh, we are seeing the last days of such uh, ideological, um, uh, uh, trying 
to capture a little bit of the prestige that he still thinks he has. So you think that this is so the so instead of global ambitions, we we see personally driven, personality driven bilateralism as an alternative foreign policy move, which of course fits into the charismatic leadership model that you you started the discussion with. I mean, what one question from from the audience is that if Lula were to win and Bolsonaro were to lose, do you see him as a leader of a united opposition. And this is of course hypothetical, but in the spirit of big persona politics, do you see him leading the opposition or can he only lead the, 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 the troops on the majority side? Well, well I, I, I think that Lula is a, is a very pragmatic, and th this is something that someone was describing uh, him uh, in a newspaper in the past few days, he's the most pragmatic politician here, uh, one of the most pragmatic politicians here in Brazil, although he, he doesn't, uh, he has his ideological uh, uh, beliefs and so on. I think that uh, he, he knows actually what to do. He's a, he's a very, uh, he was very wise during his term to, to going through different types of crises, relying actually in those kinds of political uh, bargains in a, in, a, in a good sense. So I, I think that he could do that. I think that uh, the, the difficult uh, is this kind of uh, anti-workers party sentiment, which is something that I think that uh, is uh, at least uh, decreasing, but uh, it won't disappear. And I think that it will be over-explored during the, the elections. Uh, so Lula's ability would be in the sense of trying to uh, uh, recreate a, a kind of a type of a, a new scenario for the for for politics from 2023 on, uh, and this is something that uh, it is actually very difficult to do. But if we compare Lula to Bolsonaro, it seems much easier for Lula to do than to to him to Bolsonaro. I think that. Um... To understand Brazilian politics, we had to bear in mind that there is no such a thing as a, on one side government and the other side opposition. Um, there is always something in the middle, and we call the big middle, uh, which is the the often the majority of the of the of the parliament or a considerable um, um, amount of seats in the parliament, and uh, they go with the flow, uh, meaning that they uh, with the Bolsonaro they did not go. Thankfully, they did not go all the way uh, in his uh, ideological policies, although they went all the way in dismantling environmental policies and so on, or discussing it. Um, but they, they, they go with the flow with the sense that for them, the interest is to maintain the privileges of um, uh, having access to the federal budget. Uh, so I think that both of what Lula would manage to do is that uh, probably we do not see, as uh, at least my my view is that we do not see major uh, leaders uh, running for uh, Congress, which means that probably we are going to have an increase of the opposition, but not such a large increase in the opposition parties in the Congress. We are going to have a, a, a maintenance of the of this big middle, um, uh, deciding uh, in uh, deciding on especially on the basis of the compensa economic compensation. And um, you're going to have the, the 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 right and the extreme right uh, there, probably not as big as before, but it will be uh, it will be there. Um, so, lead, if, if the question is whether Lula will be able to lead the opposition, I think the opposition itself is not um, the opposition itself is not united from the start now. I think what Bolsonaro is, uh, what Lula is managing to do is that to get his political support to win the election is, uh, and I think the opposition leaders would rather have an a, a open, uh, if it was a different different scenario, if Bolsonaro was not there and on the other side, uh, probably the opposition leaders would have, would force uh, uh, Lula or try to force Lula to have um, a more open discussion who should be um, the candidate. But that, that's not the situation that we are now. I think the, for the opposition, the view is that, well, uh, 
we are we are uh, we have this uh, election so we had to pick the best card to win uh, this game um and and the be the best card is definitely Lula in terms of popularity um popular support uh, although so I think in terms of the what's going to happen in the in the in 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 the near future in the in likely uh, government of Lula is that he will uh, be pragmatic as Emilio was saying and he's actually trying to pick a vice president who was before his uh, opponent um, in a way to show that he's he can get the support of this uh, big middle uh, political parties um, the opposition will try to get uh, to try to decided what's the legacy of after Lula because they want to see who is the next political leader uh, after Lula um, and this is one thing that will maybe divide the the opposition uh, in the near future and also yeah, as Emilio was saying the economic crisis is not going to go away uh, the next morning after Bolsonaro is out if he's out so um, it, there will be a challenge as well for Lula to maintain political support uh, throughout his term if he doesn't manage to fix uh, the economy. So I think all those uh, circumstances make the, the Lula's president, likely Lula's presidency, a very shaky moment and not necessarily um, uh, opposition leader winning the country. I think the narrative is much more nuanced and complicated than that. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. This was absolutely fascinating. And I, I seriously don't think that we can we can ask for more before before the visit. You definitely gave us a lot of food for for thought. I'm, I'm not sure whether we managed to do the hope part. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone on, on Facebook for for watching us. Uh, please keep in mind the upcoming events of, of the Democracy Institute. We will see you there.